Hello everyone. Uh, this our last week of lectures. We're going to talk about real-world applications of IPv6 and some best practices. Throughout the course, we've talked about some of the basics of IPv6 and v4, and we've tried to discuss some use cases and best practices throughout. And this week, we're going to go into more detail on the practical implementations uh, of IPv6, <clears throat> and we're going to uh, take a little more in-depth in look at some of the experiences that uh, you'll have, uh, both in the lab and when you go out into the real world to implement uh, this technology. So this week, we're going to talk about how to implement a dual stack environment. We're going to discuss the details of IPv6 math. Uh, using nibbles and non-nibble boundaries. We're going to talk about uh, some of the basics of configuration required for a v6 router interface. And we're going to talk about how some of the newer open source tools can be used to test and validate your implementations. Um, we'll describe some of the differences in the various manufacturers v6 implementations and we're going to point out some more examples of using Wireshark uh, to view some of your IPv6 specific traffic. So uh, when we talk about implementing a dual stack environment, a dual stack network means that IPv4 and IPv6 are running simultaneously. And when you're looking at transitioning from IPv4 to v6, this is uh, the most preferred method um, to make that transition. Uh, most modern day client and server operating systems have supported v6 since late 2007 and in most cases now it's enabled by default and many router and switch products have had IPv6 capability for even longer but they might require a software update or IPv6 simply needs to be configured or enabled on those devices. Older infrastructure devices might not support IP, IPv6 at all and you'll have to replace them. Most operating systems have both v4 and v6 enabled, but if the network is only configured for v4, the v6 configuration on a client operating system doesn't provide any external or off-net v6 connectivity. In this uh, screenshot, we show both protocols are enabled on this machine, uh, but the v6 address is link local, so it's not a routable address. And then in this screenshot of an IPv4 only ping, when we're pinging this site, Windows sends an A record, a DNS query to resolve the host name, and it's resolved to an IPv4 address and the pings are successful. So after a router has been configured to support v6, its router advertisements have been configured to support stateful address auto configuration, so DHCP v6, and the server has been configured for DHCP v6 DHCP v6 services. So the client receives a v6 global unicast address and can communicate on both protocols. And then when pinging the site, Windows sends both an A record and a AAAA or 4A record DNS query to resolve the host name. And here's an example of a dual stack Windows 10 professional client. And here's running ping via v6. When we're implementing v4 and v6 in the network infrastructure, it requires planning and upfront research and inventory of every single device that makes up the core of the network. So we're talking routers, switches, firewalls, and other devices. You'll have to get detailed information like model number, hardware processing capability, software version, RAM, in order to determine the possible v6 capabilities. And when you're working through these considerations, 
Um, they may help determine your implementation timeline, suggest the amount of money that needs to be budgeted, the products that need to be ordered, and the maintenance windows that need to be scheduled for doing device upgrades. And then once the network devices are ready to have V6 enabled, it's time to consider the various configurations. So here's a sample Cisco dual stack configuration. And here's one for uh, HP Enterprise networking dual stack config. So I mentioned nibbles at the beginning of uh, this lecture. So uh, a byte is eight bits and a nibble, a smaller byte, if since uh, whoever named this was trying to take the cute route, is four bits. Um, there are four nibbles in a hextet. Um, because IPv6 are expressed using hex characters and because succeeding sets of 16 bits are separated with a colon. Um, we have those four nibbles per hextet, and sometimes we'll call it a quibble, uh, which is short for a quad nibble. And the subnetting on the nibble boundary allows for carving of an address allocation. So if you're starting at WAC64, the smallest subnet, your prefixes on the nibble boundary are WAC60, WAC56, WAC52, WAC48, WAC44, WAC40, WAC 36, WAC 32, so on and so forth. Now, when we look at nibble, well, here's an example real quick of nibble boundaries. Um, uh, and again, you should take note of where these boundaries are and where the address prefixes are. So for example, uh, if you're following the nibble boundary guidelines, a WAC44 address prefix assigned to a provider yields 16 WAC48 prefixes that could be assigned, for instance, to 16 different customers. So here is an example where you have your WAC44 address prefix, and in that you yield 16 WAC48 prefixes. And here's an example of the WAC48 address prefix allocation uh, option to WAC64 prefixes. So you can use non-nibble boundaries to break down a IPv6 address allocation to smaller network subnets. So for instance, down to WAC64. So here's an example of taking a WAC61 prefix allocation down to WAC64 prefixes. And here is how you would walk through that exercise for that non-nibble boundary. So the IPv6 address 2001 colon DB8 colon 234 colon 567 double colon WAC 64 may be a node address or it also may be a network prefix address. A v6 interface ID or IID of zero is valid. So 2001 colon DB8 colon 234 colon 567 double colon WAC 64 could be written as 2001 colon db8 colon 234 colon 567 double colon zero WAC 64. Generally we represent an IPv6 network prefix as 2001 colon db8 colon 234 colon 567 double colon WAC 64 
so you may consider not using zero as an IID when addressing v6 nodes or interfaces as it could be confusing um, if only in your system documentation so how are some of the major manufacturers interpreting v6 related RFCs uh, manufacturers don't always implement everything in the RFC and therefore you really have to test every piece of equipment you plan on putting in your network. One version of a client operating system might behave a certain way during a test, but a different version, newer or older, updated or not updated, might behave differently than expected. In addition, the different behaviors among different brands of products occur. So sometimes an RFC has been updated or modified or an older RFC has been deprecated in favor of a newer one, and if manufacturers don't catch up to the newer RFC definitions, or they decide not to implement some of the newer specifications. So again, you should do extensive testing of everything in your network, validate how everything performs and operates, and you have to document that behavior for all your groups. So some of the nuances in v6 implementation versus the various clients and server and infrastructure operating systems lab tests can reveal these differences or nuances in, in the way v6 operates on these items and as we talked about some of the nuances are due to rfc definitions not being really stringent um, some are due to various RFC interpretations by software engineers, and some are due to various versions, revisions, patches, and even bugs in software. So while different operating systems behave differently with regard to v6, the operations are generally valid. But the only way you can verify and validate what you can expect to see in your network is to test everything thoroughly. Some RFCs have a bit of latitude in their specifications of operations. So, for example, um, a nuance that was not expected was the timing of recalculated V6 temporary addresses. So, RFC 4941 talked about the use of a random number generator to compute V6 temporary addresses. And the generation and regeneration of these addresses was supposed to occur periodically based on some local policy, but it didn't specify a timing definition. The operating system manufacturers designed their code with different timers, uh, leaving things a bit out of sync. So for instance, on a Windows 7 professional client, assuming that the computer stays powered on and the V6 temporary address will be written to a soft registry and will have a default lifetime of 24 hours. And then after 24 hours, TCP IP, the software stack, initiates a DAD, a duplicate address detection test, to validate that it can keep the current address. If the DAD passes, the clients uh, will keep the temporary address. So this cycle repeats for seven days. After seven days, the client initiates an internal process to regenerate a new temporary address and perform the DAD again. And if all is good, uh, he or she will now have a new temporary address. If at any time during this timing the client's powered off or the network interface is de-energized, so if it's disabled or disconnected, the temporary address timing completely starts over. OS 10, so 10.7 and above, uh, operates a little differently. Its V6 temporary address has a default lifetime of one hour. And then after one hour, the client initiates you know, an internal process to regenerate a new address and perform the DAD test. And if all's good, the computer now has a temporary address. Um, so again, sometimes if the specifications aren't extremely clear, you have these slight nuances in behavior. So here's an example of client operating system behavior when receiving multiple router advertisements. So the folks who wrote this textbook, um, uh, when they were looking at tests, uh, if a router advertisement was configured for stateful address auto configuration, so your M and L flags were set to on, your A and O flags were set to off, a client acted appropriately 
and sent the DHCP v6 solicitation message looking for a DHCP v6 server advertisement reply. However, they saw a rogue router advertisement by a client. So for Slack, the ANL flags are on and MNO flags are off, and different client operating systems reacted differently. So in the case of Windows 7 Professional, for instance, it would immediately drop the DHCP v6 configured address in favor of, in favor of a Slack address. Mac OS X, however, would maintain its DHCP v6 address for its valid lifetime and then configure a Slack address. And then Windows 10 showed it acted more like Windows uh, Windows or Mac OS 10. So again, this just goes back to test, test, test. If you're planning a V4 to V6 migration, you can't just go on to Dell's website or HP Enterprise's website or Cisco's website, find some equipment that looks good, and then plan that as soon as you plug that stuff in and write some iOS commands that things are going to work. You have to set up a test lab. You have to try every piece, make, model of each equipment. See how it behaves in your network. See how it interacts with what you have. If you're going dual stack, how does it behave with the older devices on the network? Does it cause any problems, any delays, or new latency that it adds? You have to test every possible scenario to a point, right? You're not going to be able to test everything, but you have to try and then you have to take a risk-based approach. What do I focus on? What do I not focus on? What matters for the organization? So here's an example of another nuance. Um, in 2011, there was a vendor that didn't support DHCP v6 relay on its layer 3 switch software. So DHCP v6 servers had to be connected on every VLAN where the clients needed to obtain their v6 addresses via DHCP v6. And that implementation requirement wasn't really practical. The vendor updated its software to support DHCP v6 relay. Uh, so the client's uh, DHCP v6 requests get relayed as appropriate. But this situation illustrates the need to update software and older infrastructure devices and once again to perform tests. Uh, another nuance example was when a vendor's infrastructure device supported v6, but its v6 features and functions could only be configured by the CLI and not its GUI. Some minor variations exist in v6 functional capabilities across all operating systems and that's sometimes due to which version and which service packs, patches, or updates have been installed. And again, to fully understand what will work and how, how the systems will behave, full testing must be performed on every variation of the software in the network. Not just client and server, but infrastructure, embedded, special purpose devices, IoT, anything that is connected to the network. So now we're going to talk about some open source tools that really focus on IPv6. Um, so we'll talk about Wireshark coloring rules, filters, config profiles, commenting, security assessment tools like THC IPv6, and SI6 Network's IPv6 toolkit. So Wireshark has the capability of applying, so we talk about wire, uh, Wireshark coloring rules, uh, capability of applying a color scheme to different types of traffic. So you can use these colors to distinguish IPv6 from V4, ICMP v6 from ICMP, or even a very specific type of packet or contents from another. Uh, it has some predefined color rule definitions that you can modify. You can also create your own definitions. Would have helped if I switched the slide. So there's the slide. Uh, and here's, here's some example of a Wireshark coloring rule. And you can pick any color. Any color you want. Taupe. Cerulean. It's 
great. And here's a coloring rule list in Wireshark. Wireshark display filters. So you can use display filters in Wireshark to either filter specific types of traffic you want to view or filter out specific type of traffic you don't need to view. And Wireshark has hundreds of display filter definitions and three high level filters for IPv6 specifically. IPv6, ICMPv6, and DHCPv6. So here's an example of creating a Wireshark display filter. And here's an example of the Wireshark display filter output. So the configuration profiles feature in Wireshark provides the capability of setting different views uh, where you can have specific coloring rules, display filters, appearance layouts, and more that, that provides different overall viewing aspects based on what you need to be looking at and focusing on. It defines a few default configuration profiles, and you can copy a profile and then modify it to create a new profile. So here is an example of creating a Wireshark configuration profile. And here is the view of a new Wireshark configuration profile. The packet comment feature in Wireshark was introduced in version 1.8. It enables users to add metadata to a packet in the form of a note. So packet comments, also in Wireshark known as inline notes, are extremely useful when capturing a trace file, and noting specific milestones or events as they occur, when viewing or running a capture. They're also useful when going back after a trace file has been saved and making notes. And you can annotate any packet with 2,500 characters. Here's an example of adding a packet comment. And this is the uh, modal box to enter a comment. And here's an example displaying packets that have comments. So security assessment and troubleshooting tools for IPv6. Because IPv6 has some different operational characteristics than v4, you need tools that can provide specific v6 types of testing or verification of v6 operations. This is especially the case as you build your v6 test lab and begin testing all the different devices and operating systems for v6 operational functions. You should not only observe how those devices perform in the mode of what you consider to be expected results, you have to um, test for variances of how they operate when in not normal operations or abnormal operations uh, are introduced into your network. So um, rogue IPv6 routers and rogue DHCPv6 servers. Uh, tool new two, two new toolkits have been out for a few years. The THC IPv6 and SI6 Networks IPv6 Toolkit. Both toolkits are used to attack, attack the v6 protocol suite uh, for testing purposes. So here's an example of um, THC IPv6 uh, injecting a rogue router advertisement. And here is a rogue DHCPv6 advertisement being injected by the THC IPv6 tool. And here's another rogue router advertisement message being injected by SI6 Network's IPv6 toolkit. So, in summary, we talked about a dual stack network that's running IPv4 and v6 simultaneously. Remember a nibble is 4 bits, uh, a byte is 8 bits in a IPv6 address, 
which is expressed using hexadecimal characters. It's important to understand how major manufacturers interpret V6 related RFCs. Um, pro tip, they're different, so always make sure you test, test, test. Nuances in V6 implementations can be attributed to RFC definitions that aren't stringent or clear. Uh, various RFC interpretations by software and hardware engineers, uh, various versions, revisions, patches, and software bugs uh, that are unique to each device. And then because V6 has different operational characteristics, you need tools that provide specific V6 types of testing or verification of V6 operations. And we talked about Wireshark, THC IPv6, and SI6 Network's IPv6 toolkit.